In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I sit here in the little grotto in my hometown church of Clinton, Mass., St. John, the guardian of Our Lady, church by the great ancestors of the faithful departed. I think so much of my granddad, James Hastings, who was so much a part of that early new evangelization of the Catholic Church. I think of my dad being such a pillar of this particular church on the altar as a lector for 45 years plus. Both my mom and my dad were catechists here in this particular church for many years and did great honor and service to Jesus by proclaiming the truth of the Catholic faith. I will be faithful to those words of our Lord through Mary and keep my teaching faithful to the Catholic Catechism to now honor my parents, John and Mary Kilcoyne, with my ministry in gratitude for one great life lived. Amen. Talk Catholic. And now Talk Catholic with Tim Kilcoyne, a show about faith and other teachings. TalkCatholic.com with Tim Kilcoyne. It is Christmas time, and boy, do we need it. And we need to prolong it as long as possible. Do not let the globalist, new world order, tyrannical state dictators try to steal your Christmas too. They've had their day in 2020, and it is indeed a new day. We are going to usher in some beautiful Christmas stories with this particular show from a particular book, Treasured Stories of Christmas, and I just want to hearken back to Christmases of old that we might remember exactly why we're here and what this country was founded on. But may we start with a prayer for Christmas time. Father Christmas, you have given us memories of old, of childhood, helping us to remember holy childhood, a time of innocence and wonder in our own lives that you have said, unless you become like the least of these, you shall not inherit eternal life. We are to remember and to perpetuate our holy childhood from cradle to grave in you this Christmas and every Christmas until we are with you for an eternal Christmas. May the Christ child arise. May you be born again into the maturity of grace and wisdom that is the real you amidst all the noise, all the temptation, all the hatred. For love is born on Christmas Day and every day, and you have created us to be part of that stable. In Jesus' name, through Mary, St. Joseph, and all the shepherds and magi, amen. An appropriate Christmas story to celebrate our freedom, and we need to do that more than ever at this time. The story called A Fragile Moment by E.L. Huffin. The telegram was waiting for me. Imperative training completed soon as possible. No Christmas leaves authorized. Then, just before my commanding officer's name, there were the ironic words, Merry Christmas. So that was that. There would be no chance to get home, no chance even to try for a little holiday feeling in this fearful year. I was an army pilot on assignment for special training in celestial navigation at Chicago's Adler Planetarium. This was December 1941. Our nation had been in World War II for only a few weeks. Ours was a gloomy bunch that gathered for study in the planetarium's viewing arena that Christmas Eve. Our teacher realized when she came out to speak that we were not the most receptive of classes. Gentlemen, she says, this is going to be an unusual session. Our engineers have been working since the early hours of this morning in an effort to produce what you are about to see. They want you to accept it as their Christmas gift to you. Slowly the lights lowered and overhead the stars appeared in view, brighter and brighter until we were deep in a panorama of dazzling beauty. Here are the heavens, the teacher said, her voice soft, her tone reverent. Here are the heavens, just as they were that night when Christ Jesus was born. Except for a howling wind outside, not a sound could be heard. We stared with the kind of wonder that the shepherds must have known 2,000 years earlier. In the midst of war, I had a vision of peace and of hope for a sick world that left me breathless. When the lights came up again, we left the auditorium in silence. Our gloom was lost, as such things are always lost when we let the fact of his birth take over. I'm reminded of a particular documentary on Vietnam. Letters from Vietnam, I believe. And there was one letter, a very beautiful story, about how the soldiers on both sides of the battlefield came to that 
Silent Night, one very still night. Christmas Eve, during the war. And they sang Christmas songs. Silent Night itself. Across the hillside, from both angles. Of the battlefield. For they all knew exactly what the night was all about. Is this a time to remember such unbelievably important historical events to call our history as Americans to mind? Nobody was offended. Nobody was trying to sue the Pentagon. It didn't mean that everybody was of the same faith, but they knew that Christmas is worth celebrating for everyone, and it doesn't offend anyone except those that live in hate. So may we reflect on the peacemakers from both sides of the aisle of ideology and faith, tradition, and recognize the common bond of humanity that is so celebrated at Christmas time. In this first story, may we salute at Christmas time our military. Let us go on. The Runaway Boy by Chase Walker. There is something about a holiday that turns normally silent people, total strangers, into secret confiding friends. Such was the case one Christmas Eve not long ago aboard a speeding Midwestern train. The electric spirit of the season seemed to fill each car. In one seat, a little girl sporting a big yellow bow in her hair asked anxiously how much longer to grandma's. A few seats away, a sailor proudly held out a wallet-sized photograph of his sweetheart, showing it to the others around him. Everyone seemed to be talking and laughing, everyone except one young man and his seat companion, a kindly-looking gentleman with gray-white hair. The man had vainly attempted to start a conversation, but the boy was preoccupied. He never looked away from the window. Finally, the man gave up and went back to reading his book until he realized the young man was crying, a muffled, quiet crying, but unmistakably crying. Need a handkerchief, the man asked. Yes, sir, answered the boy. Thank you. There was a moment's silence. Is there anything I can do, son? No, I'm afraid not. It's too late. The boy put the handkerchief to his face again. Placing his hand on the boy's shoulder, the man consoled him. Sometimes we only think it's too late. Why don't you tell me the problem? Let me decide. Well, the boy hesitated, then began. Well, almost four months ago, you see, I ran away from home. I just couldn't take it anymore. My schoolwork was horrible, and I was sick to death of doing chores morning and night. Well, I told Dad, and we had a terrible argument. That night, I packed some clothes and headed for the city. I had a little money saved and figured I could get a job. In less than a week, I realized that I had made a mistake. I was tempted to tell Mom and Dad that I wanted to come home when I wrote them not to worry, but I was too embarrassed. Many nights I slept in the streets, hungry, more often than not. The boy blew his nose and dabbed his eyes again. Finally, last week, I broke down and wrote Dad that I wanted to come home, though I knew he might not want me back. I told him I'd be on his train, and that if I was welcome, he should tie a red cloth on the big elm at the back of the farm. The train runs right past our farm, and that old tree drapes over the fence. Well, I think you'll be welcome, son, the man assured him. Picking up the book, which had lain in his lap, the old man leafed through it. You probably think your story is unique, but in this book, this Bible, there is a story much like yours. It's the story of the prodigal son. Do you know it? The boy shook his head no. Then I want to read it to you, and the old man read that familiar story. When he had finished, the boy's face wore a smile. I believe most fathers are filled with the same forgiving spirit as in this story, the man said, and I believe your father will be more than willing to have you back. The boy suddenly sat upright. We're almost there, he said. Our place is right after the next bend. Oh, I'm afraid to look. Then I'll look for you, volunteered the man. The telephone poles raced by. For a moment, the man's faith wavered. What if there were no signal in the elm tree? Just then, the train swung around the bend, and up ahead he saw the huge elm dancing in the wind, its branches bare against the steely gray and snowy fields, bare, except for dozens of red banners that flapped from every conceivable limb. They shouted the news to a runaway boy that all was forgiven at Christmas. We salute at Christmas time all runaways, young and old, who have the humility to come home. I'm reminded of working years ago at a boy's home. And for whatever reason, this comes into my mind, this particular lad, probably about 12 years of age, and he was a terror this particular night and wanted to, um, he wanted to hurt everyone in sight. It was a sign to me to track him down and contain him as we were 
waiting for police to come. And I ended up under a stairwell, just holding him. And, uh, and all of a sudden, he just broke down and shared his whole life with me. And it was, it was so difficult. We just don't know what's behind the anger sometimes. And at bare minimum, we have to wait and we have to be patient and we have to hang in there with people just exactly as Jesus hung in there with us. And I was so grateful that I was able to do that with this lad that particular night. And I hope and pray it's providential that I remember the story. At Christmas time, may he be blessed wherever he might be today. Let us go on. The Dime Store Angel, Barbara Estelle Shepard, author. When our twin daughters were toddlers and Scotty was still a baby, my husband Dick and I dug into our meager Christmas fund to buy a dime store angel for the top of our tree. Aesthetically, she was no prize. The plastic wings were lopsided, the gaudy robes painted haphazardly, the reds splashing over into the blues and purples. At night, though, she underwent a mysterious change. The light glowing from inside her robe softened the colors and her golden hair shone with the aura of a halo. For six years, she had the place of honor at the top of our tree. For six years, as in most families, Christmas was a time to be especially grateful for the wonderful gifts of God. And then in the seventh year, as summer enfolded us in her warm lethargy, I became aware of a new life gently stirring beneath my heart. Of all God's gifts, this seemed the culmination, for we had long prayed for another child. I came home from the doctor's office and plunged straight into plans for a mood-setting dinner. That evening, when Dick walked in, candles flickered on the table and the children took their places, self-conscious in Sunday clothes, when it's just Wednesday. Oh, he grinned. Mother's up to something, one of those special dinners again. I smiled and waited till halfway through the meal to make the announcement, but I got no further than the first informative sentence. You mean we're going to have a baby? squealed Miriam. Milk overturned and chairs clattered, doors slammed, and Dick and I were alone with our happiness while our three small Paul Revere's galloped wildly over the neighborhood shouting their news to everyone within lung distance. Summer and fall sped by as we turned the spare room into a nursery and scraped and repainted baby furniture. December came again. Once more we were on the verge of Christmas. Then one morning, eight weeks too soon for our new nursery to be occupied, I was rushed to the hospital. Shortly past noon, our four-pound son was born. Still groggy from the anesthetic, I was wheeled, bed and all, to the nursery to view Kirk, Stephen, through an incubator porthole. Dick silently squeezed my hand while we absorbed the doctor's account of the dangers Kirk would have to overcome in order to survive. Added to his prematurity was the urgency for a complete blood exchange to offset problems. All that long afternoon, Dick and I prayed desperately that our son's life be spared. It was evening when I awoke from an uneasy doze to find our minister standing by the bed. No word was spoken, but as he clasped my hand, I knew our little boy had lived less than 12 hours. During the rest of that week in the hospital, grief and disbelief swept over me by turn. At last, Dick came to take me home. He loaded my arms with a huge bouquet of red roses, but flowers can never fill arms that ache to hold a baby. In the street outside, I was astonished to see signs of Christmas everywhere. The decorated stores, the hurrying shoppers, the lights strung from every lamppost. I had forgotten the season. For the sake of the children at home, we agreed we would go through the emotions. But it would be no more than that. And so a few days later, Dick bought a tree and mechanically I joined him and the children in draping tinsel and hanging glass balls from the branches. Last of all, on the very top, went the forlorn dime store angel. Then Dick flipped the switch, and again, she was beautiful. Scotty gazed upward for a moment, then said softly, Daddy, this year we have a real angel, don't we? The one God gave us. And Dick and I, in our poverty, were going to give Christmas to our children, forgetting that it is always we who receive it from them. For, of course, God was the reality in tragedy, as he had been in our joys, the unchanging joy at the heart of all things. Scotty's words were for me like the light streaming now from the plastic angel transforming what was poor and ugly on the surface into glory. What comes to mind immediately is an old line, a favorite line of a Columban priest from Clinton, Mass., now with the Lord, Father Paul O'Malley. And he used to often say, 
Life is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be lived. This little story in a family that had to have been so shaken, most of all the parents for sure, by the early death of a loved one, a child just coming into the world at Christmas time. And yet, who was it that lifted them up as leaven but the children themselves, the other three? And I salute in this particular case all large families. Families that chose to be fruitful and multiply. But as Mother Angelica might say, not all answers are promises. In a world that doesn't understand the holiness of a large family, maybe this story needs to be told again. Because of the long-running contraceptive culture that has brought on a demographic winter, all over the world. I remember my own childhood neighborhood was absolutely loaded with kids, namely the baby boomers. A World War II generation was clearly most grateful. Seldom do we see large groups of children virtually anywhere. Such a tragedy. More importantly, people that took it upon themselves, as I hear them often saying, oh, I'm all done. No more children here. Eternal news flash. Only God makes that decision. Does that not characterize the culture in which we live? And now it, as it escalates towards euthanasia, if we don't right the ship quickly, God bless large families. And I'm thinking of one big one at my hometown parish of St. John, the guardian of Our Lady, as they are there every Sunday as a simple catechism class to the whole parish. They know who they are. I call them the little apostles. And I pray for them every single day that this particular family at St. John's know my love and my prayers, but for all large families who gave that fiat of Mary to our Lord fully. And it's not without bumps and bruises, but boy, is there a lot of joy. Let's take a break. This is WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. Here's a dandy little story for Christmas. Pattern of Love by Jack Smith. I didn't question Timmy, age nine, or his seven-year-old brother Billy about the brown wrapping paper they passed back and forth between them as we visited each store. Every year at Christmas time, our service club takes the children from Port families in our town on a personally conducted shopping tour. I was assigned Timmy and Billy, whose father was out of work. After giving them the allotted $4 each, we began our trip. At different stores, I made suggestions, but always their answer was a solemn shake of the head, no. Finally, I asked, where would you suggest we look? Could we go to a shoe store, sir? Answered Timmy. We'd like a pair of shoes for our daddy so he can go to work. In the shoe store, the clerk asked what the boys wanted. Out came the brown paper. We want a pair of work shoes to fit this foot, they said. Billy explained that it was a pattern of their daddy's foot. They had it drawn while he was asleep in a chair. The clerk held the paper against the measuring stick, then walked away. Soon he came with an open box. Will these do, he asked. Timmy and Billy handled the shoes with great eagerness. How much do they cost, asked Billy. Then Timmy saw the price on the box. They're sixteen ninety five. he said in dismay. We only have $8. I looked at the clerk and he cleared his throat. That's the regular price, he said, but they're on sale. Three ninety eight today only. Then, with shoes happily in hand, the boys bought gifts for their mother and the two little sisters. Not once did they think of themselves. The day after Christmas, the boy's father stopped me on the street. The new shoes were on his feet. Gratitude was in his eyes. I just thank Jesus for people who care, he said. And I thank Jesus for your two sons, I replied. They taught me more about Christmas in one evening than I had learned in a lifetime. Don't ever underestimate the giving nature of children. In fact, I've often given the advice to many who may be dealing with particular family problems and especially addictions. The best thing that you can do is expand your definition, your understanding of family. Focus more on God's bigger family, the one that you're going to be with in heaven if we get there. And you can teach your little ones to do that at a very early age. The more you focus on the bigger family, the spiritual family, God's family, the less selfish and isolated your family will be. Many of the sins that afflict family life are because we all keep it within. I've often said, pride and privacy helps no one. It's a terrible scourge where people think that they need to keep things quiet and to themselves will work it out, but they never work it out. The only way that they get real help for their family is by accepting the help from an outsider, the infamous stranger who could well be Christ himself. That's very often how the house gets cleaned up. Outreach 
Keep moving outward. Don't let it stay all inside. It only festers and magnifies. This is where the corporal works of mercy really do come in. Teaching altruism, kenosis, self-emptying, the cross, getting out of yourself. So we salute at Christmas time, all children at heart who know this truth best. In the words of an old friend, Monsignor Bob Gust, the title of his book, Love is the message I heard. Let us go on. A Lonely Cafeteria by Florence Moth as we finish up. On Christmas morning, the cafeteria looks sterile. White tablecloths, cold tiled floors, and white uniform counter girls and busboys bustling about. Even the Christmas tree set up in the corner did nothing to dispel my feelings of depression as I arrived to begin my duties as supervisor. The first customers arriving for breakfast were the elderly residents of the hotel. This morning, as they did each day, they put their food on their trays, paid the cashier, and then each went to a lonely separate table. One or two ventured a hesitant, Merry Christmas, but there was no warmth in their voices. Forgetting my own resentment at having to leave a warm home to work on Christmas, I began to walk among the tables, nodding to customers and trying to smile, the Merry Christmas. I did not really feel. Then from the corner of my eye, I spotted four of the busboys in a huddle. Thinking they were dawdling, I started to reprimand them, but before I could speak out, I heard some barely audible sounds. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The boys were singing, and now the melody rose and flowed through the room, quiet but beautiful in muted harmony. Faces came alive with surprise and reverence. One of the boys turned off the lights, Only the tree glowed then, its lights reflecting the gay bulbs and tinsel. The prayer ended and the room was hushed. Someone sighed. Then the boys sang, Silent Night, Adeste Fidelis, and Hark the Herald Angels Sing. As they sang, they moved about the room, working and encouraging the timid to join in the caroling. When breakfast was over, the conversation was warm and animated, and the dinners moved reluctantly from the room. And when breakfast was over... The conversation was warm and animated, and the diners moved reluctantly from the room. Someone shouted, Merry Christmas, and his words were echoed all down the line. Over these tired, lonely old faces had swept the transforming spirit of Christmas, a spirit that never pales, never ages, never loses its power. May we salute all those who may have to work on Christmas in service to us. Let us think about not only the service industry of hotels and restaurants, gas stations, but let us not forget the military, our armed services. And we should be reminded that they are under obligation to keep America free, most especially our elections. May God bless America and may God bless our church For 2020 was a rough one for everyone, trying to uphold our church's teachings faithfully. May our bishops and priests, deacons, brothers, sisters, monks, and lowly lay religious educators like myself be lifted up and never disheartened for our Lord is the joy, our Lord is the peace, our Lord is the King. From WQPH Radio 89.3 FM, wishing all of you a blessed and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And please don't forget something in our stocking to keep it all going. Make your donation and offer a nice prayer for Mary Ann Harold, our foundress. The behind-the-scenes work that she does and all the lay troopers is just an amazing feat. We pray bearing Christmas fruit every day. Ave Maria and Feliz Navidad. Praise be the Christ child. Let your light shine. That is what it's all about here at WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. But we need to hear your story. You want your voice to be his voice. That is making the faith known to others. Please, my number is 877-625-3727. Tim Kilcoyne, TalkCatholic.com. St. Mother Teresa told us, your ministry is your work right where you are. Grab on to this microphone. God bless.